Good morning and welcome to worship at Dunwoody United Methodist Church. It is so good for you to be here with us in the sanctuary and those who are joining with us on live streaming this day. I am David Melton, one of the pastors here, and it is my privilege to welcome you this morning and to have you as a part of this worship and the fellowship of this congregation. I especially want to encourage you to um, register your attendance with us today. You'll see the QR code on the screen, which you may use your phone to use at this point. And there are also fellowship pads in the seat closest to the center aisle. I have now anointed those of you who are sitting closest to the center aisle to make sure those on your row have an opportunity to register their, your, their attendance here this day. We are so glad that you are here with us. We especially would like to welcome those of you who may be guests with us, either online or here in the sanctuary this day. If you are here with us in the sanctuary, I hope you will find a way to reach out to those around you to spend some time at one of our welcome desks that we have and to stop by and pick up uh, your gift from us this day, which is a water bottle with the Dunwoody United Methodist Church logo upon it. Uh, that is our gift to you for being with us here today, and it also is a great way to find out more information about the life of our church. You will note on the, the back page of our, our bulletin today, our, now, our worship sheet, you will see there announcements that we have about things coming up in our life of our church. And in particular, I'd like to highlight our golf cart ministry. You'll notice that a member of our congregation, a couple of families got together and felt this was a need for our congregation. So on Sunday mornings, we do provide uh, transportation from the north lot, the lower lot of our church here uh, to allow folks to have a front door service and it would be great to add more drivers to our golf cart. There is training uh, to be done with that, and we can give you more information related to the stipulations and regulations related to that. So we would like for those to step forward that would be uh, willing to be uh, a first person to welcome folks to the life of our church each week. Let us now stand together and join in these words of call to worship. Gather us in, Lord and hear our prayers. We have come to this place in need for healing and hope. Gather us in, Lord, and heal our spirits. We come here seeking guidance and strength. Gather us in, Lord, and open our hearts to receive your word. Open our hearts, our spirits, our souls to comprehend your word and follow you faithfully. Amen. Our hymn is How Great Thou Art, number 77.
how great God is in our lives. And we come this day to proclaim in song, but also in word, our beliefs in God. Today we'll be using for our affirmation of faith, the Apostles' Creed. Let us join together in these words. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day he rose from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. seated. We come now to a time of prayer, and I invite you to find the prayer concerns listed on the back of the bulletin today. These are updated throughout the week on the church website. Today we offer our Christian sympathy to Matt and Margaret Stone on the death of Matt's father, Kerwin, on July the 1st. Kerwin is the grandfather of Charlotte and Jackson. And to Julie and Tracy Barrett on the death of Julie's father, Benny James. Benny is the grandfather of Kate, Lauren, and Lucy. We extend our Christian sympathy to Lisa and Walter Wallace and their family on the recent death of Lisa's mother, Young Hoon Lee, on July the 4th. And to Karen Heinsen and her family on the death of her brother-in-law, Dr. Ed Heinsen, on July the 3rd. Let us go now to God in a time of prayer, a time of silent prayer followed by the spoken prayer. Let us pray. Loving and living God, we come to you this day with gratitude for all the many blessings you have provided to us. We give you thanks for the gift of the rain to water the earth, for the gift of community to support and love us, and for the gift of the Holy Spirit to be our advocate and our companion on this journey of life. Oh God, we are in the midst of frightening times with war in Ukraine that continues where innocent people are harmed and a country is obliterated. We live in a time when anger seems to be the way to treat others and to respond to any difficulty. Be with us, merciful God. We don't want to live this way. We seek your peace and your healing love. Our hearts today, O oh God, are filled with concern for those who face times of difficulty for those who are ill, and for those who are grieving the death of loved ones and friends. We pray that your love and grace will bring peace and comfort to all of those who are suffering. We pray also today, O oh God, for the victims of gun violence in our country. And we pray, O oh God, that our leaders will work together to find answers to this escalating and senseless problem. Be with all of us, O oh Lord. Heal our wounds. Direct our lives and pathways of peace. Help us truly to be your hands and feet in this world. We pray all these things in the name of Jesus, who taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. 
thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. There are many ways that we can respond to lo God's love and grace in our lives. Giving of our offering is one of those ways. Another way is to give of our time. And one of those ways here at Dunwoody is through our annual food stock event. So I'll ask you to direct your attention to the screens for a brief video. As a church, one of Dunwoody's greatest strengths in ministries is providing meals to those that need them both locally 
and around the world. DUMC has a long tradition of feeding ministries, from stocking the pantry shelves at the CAC to providing meals for Trinity Table, but by far our largest and most celebrated meal packing event is Food Stock. Last year, over 1,300 volunteers provided 300,000 meals that were shipped to Haiti. This year, we're calling everyone to come together again for another great event. Food Stock is an event open to the entire community and participants of all ages. It always brings a great social and energetic atmosphere. So we know that you'll want to join us for Food Stock. Mark your calendars for August the 20th. It's a Saturday. Be sure to invite a neighbor and register today. Registration is open.
Good morning. So I must admit, I've already learned a few things from Phil. One of those being that the time slot allotted to a sermon is merely a suggestion. (laughs) So I hope all of you are uh, comfortable because we'll be here a while. I'm just kidding. Just kidding. But I do have a tendency to acquire things from people that I like and admire. I don't mean things as in possessions. I mean things as in habits or sayings. I love to pick up on people's sayings. I can't always tell them to you off the top of my head, but when the moment calls for it, they come forth from the depths of my brain at just the right moment. So as you're around me, you'll hear more and more of them, but if you reach out to me and you tell me that I did something well, or you really enjoyed something, I might respond with a a saying that I learned from my dad. Even a blind squirrel finds a nut every once in a while. (laughs) But while Kylie and I were traveling, we found ourselves in Bullhead City, Arizona, and we made friends with another couple that was about our age. David was also a travel nurse, and his wife, Jess, was traveling along with him, and they were from Wisconsin. So we had a lot of fun hanging out together. We would go for hikes. We would watch football games and just get together and go out to dinner. But before I knew it, Kylie would ask me a question and I would respond with, oh, I suppose. I had picked up a new habit from our northern friends. Now David and Jess thought it was funny because they knew that I loved and appreciated them. But if I were to say that up north to the wrong person, they might not find it so funny. They might think that yet again a southerner is making fun of someone from the north. There would be a misunderstanding. Our scripture text today deals with a misunderstanding. After the stoning of Stephen, many of Jesus' followers have begun to scatter and move away from Jerusalem because it is no longer safe for them there. Philip, who, like Stephen, was one of the seven chosen to serve, is one of those people who has left Jerusalem. We pick up today in Acts chapter 8, starting with verse 4. Now those who were scattered went from place to place proclaiming the word. Philip went down to the city of Samaria and proclaimed the Messiah to them. The crowds with one accord listened eagerly to what was said by Philip, hearing and seeing the signs that he did. For unclean spirits, crying with loud shrieks, came out of many who were possessed, and many others who were paralyzed or lame were cured. So there was great joy in that city. Now a certain man named Simon had previously practiced magic in the city and amazed the people of Samaria by saying that he was someone great. All of them, from the least to the greatest, listened to him eagerly, saying, This man is the power of God that is called great. And they listened to him eagerly because for a long time he had amazed them with his magic. But when they believed Philip, who was proclaiming the good news about the kingdom of God in the name of Jesus Christ, they were baptized, both men and women. Even Simon believed him. After being baptized, he stayed constantly with Philip and was amazed when he saw the signs and great miracles that took place. Now when the apostles at Jerusalem heard that Samaria had accepted the word of God, they sent Peter and John to them. The two went down and prayed for them that they might receive the Holy Spirit. For as yet the Spirit had not come upon any of them. They had only been baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. Then Peter and John laid their hands on them and received, they received the Holy Spirit. Now when Simon saw that the Spirit was given through the laying on of the apostles' hands, he offered them money, saying, Give me also this power, so that anyone on whom I lay my hands may receive the Holy Spirit. But Peter said to him, May your silver perish with you, because you thought you could obtain God's gift with money. You have no part or share in this, for your heart is not right before God. Repent, therefore, of this wickedness of yours, and pray to the Lord that, if possible, the intent of your heart may be forgiven you. For I see that you are in the gall of bitterness and the chains of wickedness. Now Simon answered, Pray for me. To the Lord, that nothing of what you have said may happen to me. 
Now after Peter and John had testified and spoken the word of the Lord, they returned to Jerusalem, proclaiming the good news to many villages of the Samaritans. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Now we don't think of magicians as powerful people. We think of them as tricksters or entertainers, right? We know that they don't have any real power. We know there's a way to explain what they're doing We just don't know how. When I was in high school, there was a foreign exchange student named Bear. He loved to perform magic tricks. Every day in gym class, he had something new to show us. It was a card trick or something of that sort. But there was one trick that he had that was his favorite, and it was our favorite. It involved two little red foam hearts. He would keep one in his hand, And then he would place the other one in someone else's hand and tell them to hold it tight in their fist. He would wave his arms around and say a magic spell and then tell the other person to open their hand. And magically, both of the hearts were in the other person's hand. All of the students would stand there ooing and aahing in amazement. But after a while, when you paid close attention, it was easy to see what was happening. It was easy to figure out how he was doing what he was doing. But the amazement experienced in the text today, it's more than just ooing and aahing. The people of Samaria believe that Simon is the power of God, that he is the power of God. He's doing more than just your average party trick. The people hold him in high esteem and believe that he has real power. He leaves them feeling astonished, in awe, maybe even beside themselves. Now, when I was in high school, we were playing a game and we were losing to a team that we should have beaten easily. If you're a Falcons fan, you know this feeling, right? (laughs) It was the last few seconds of the game. The other team had the ball and all they had to do was snap the ball one last time and the game would be over. All of us were moping around, angry at ourselves for not playing better. But the team lined up for one last play. The quarterback got under the center. He snapped the ball and he dropped the ball. All of a sudden, it was a mad dash for everyone to try and recover the fumble. Finally, one of my teammates recovered the fumble in the end zone and we won in the last seconds. The entire sideline erupted. The whole team sprinted onto the field, tackling each other, hitting each other in the air. One of my coaches took a few steps off the sideline and dropped to his knees with his jaw wide open because he could not believe what had just happened. Whoops. (laughs) I knew that was going to happen. We were all beside ourselves. We could not believe that In the last seconds, it had gone from a gutting loss to a miraculous victory. In the final seconds of the game. Now, did you pick up on there's a lot of amazement in this story? Everyone is amazed at everything, apparently. The people of Samaria are amazed by Simon and his power. Then they're amazed by Philip and his teaching and the miracles that he performs. Even Simon was amazed by Philip. Word finally reaches the apostles and they send Peter and John to see what is happening in Samaria. And even they are impressed by what's happening. They lay hands on the people there and pray over those who have been baptized and they are filled with the Holy Spirit. Now Simon, it doesn't say this in the text, but I imagine he must have been amazed by what he saw. See, Simon, ever since Philip came to town, has followed Philip and witnessed what Philip has done. He's heard the preaching and the teaching. He's seen all the miracles and the healing. He's stuck right with Philip. Then the apostles come to town and he does the same thing. He witnesses the power of the Holy Spirit that goes through the apostles and into these baptized people. He wants to be like the apostles. He wants to be like Philip. He wants to be a part of the Jesus movement. So why does Peter respond the way that he does? 
What's the big deal? It doesn't tell us that Simon had some evil intention in his heart. It doesn't say that he's trying to take advantage of anyone. He just offers Peter money because he wants the power of the Holy Spirit. There's a misunderstanding. Simon doesn't get how this works. He has been been converted. He's been baptized. He believes, but he doesn't know how things work. He thinks that the power of the Holy Spirit, that the life of faith is something to be acquired. He doesn't understand that it's something that you give your life to. Now, what's the difference? Acquiring something versus giving your life to it. I think about acquiring in terms of making an investment. Recently, I heard an interview with Peter Guber, who is one of the co-owners of the Golden State Warriors. He knows something about making a good investment in a sports franchise. He described acquiring a sports team as renting it. He says that you own the right to help manage the organization to its success. Now, he didn't say this, but I think that's with the hope that when you sell your stake in the team or whatever you have invested your money in, that it will be mer- worth more than when you acquired it, right? All of the decisions that you make, all of the work that you do when you make an investment is with the intention of making more money when you sell whatever asset it is that you have acquired. We all know what that kind of focus, what those kinds of decisions can do to a person, right? We've seen it play out over and over again in our world. That's how Simon sees the power of the Holy Spirit. Simon is still thinking like a powerful magician. He's witnessed the power of Philip and of the apostles He wants that power. But even though he's been converted, even though he's been baptized, he still wants to be respected. He wants people to see him as powerful. He still wants to be famous. He knows that if he acquires this power, people will think he is even greater. It'll be an even more powerful trick in his bag of tricks. He doesn't understand that Giving your life to God doesn't bring fame and fortune. It's not about climbing the ladder to success. It's about going down the ladder to the least, the last, and the lost. It means ordering your life and making decisions in a way with the entire community in mind, not just yourself and your family. You don't have to prove yourself to God. God already knows who you are and loves you because of who you are. Simon doesn't understand that yet. Did you know that most pastors never wanted to be a pastor? I'm serious. Ask Kathy or David or Phil or Calissa or any of us. We will all tell you a similar story about how we had a plan for our life and God dragged us into the ministry, sometimes kicking and screaming. I never intended on being a pastor. I was going to LaGrange College with a clear focus. I was going to play football and I was going to graduate with a degree in engineering. I knew that that career path would allow me to have a decent salary. I could have all the things I wanted in life. A nice house, a nice car. Maybe if I worked really hard, an extra house at the lake. You've heard all the things before. My mom, before I started my freshman year, she asked, have you ever thought about being a pastor? I said, no. (laughs) Why would I do that? That doesn't sound like a fun life. That wasn't the life I wanted to live. So it was orientation. Before I started school, I learned that you had to take a basic level religion course during your time in college in order to graduate. So I thought I would go ahead I would get that requirement out of the way my first semester. So I signed up for a class called youth ministry. On the first day of class, there's five other people in the classroom with me. That should have been a hint that something was wrong. 
The professor walks in from the back of the room and he sees me sitting on the front row. He launches into this long monologue about how this is an upper level religion course. It doesn't count for your basic religion requirement and he goes on and on and on trying to scare me into dropping the class. He knew I was not supposed to be there as a first semester freshman. But me being me, I was like, yeah, youth ministry, I enjoyed going to youth. This should be fun. At the end of that semester, I declared as a religion major. Go figure. But even then, I still tried to find other ways to live out my call that didn't involve being an actual pastor. I wanted to do something that was like ministry, but wasn't actually ministry. No matter what career I found, no matter what idea I had, it never worked out. There was always this consistent call that you are supposed to be a pastor. Being in church long enough, I had seen and heard enough stories about people running from their call, and I knew I better do it. Now, I realize that we are in church. We probably feel pretty good about our relationship with God, how we are living our lives and the decisions that we make. When I say give your life to God, all of you have a clear picture of what that means, right? You've heard it for a long, long time, over and over again at church, camp meeting, revival, Bible study, wherever you may find yourself. But I don't mean praying a prayer. I don't mean getting saved. I mean how you live your daily life. When you go home this week, what are the reasons that you make the decisions you make? What is that basis, the center that you live your life out of? Are you still trying to prove that you are worthy of love? Or have you accepted the gift of love that God freely gives? Are you focused on yourself and your family and what's best for you? Or are you focused on the whole community? I wonder how all of us, myself included, have acquired faith instead of given our life to God. To follow God wherever God may lead. Even as I stand here today preaching a sermon as a pastor of this church, I still have to visit this question daily. Even after I've been to seminary and mastered divinity, whatever that means, it's something I have to circle back to. I have to make adjustments when I miss a step. It's not an easy life. It's not an easy call. But when people give their life to God, when we work together with the Holy Spirit, there is no limit to the good that can be done in this world. There is no limit to the healing that can happen within each one of us, within our families, in our communities. That's why I gave my life to God. That's why I do my best to follow my call. As we continue on the road with the Holy Spirit this summer, as we read more texts that tell of the stories and the power of the Holy Spirit, I hope that you will see the way that the Spirit is still working in your life, still working in this church and in our world. I hope that you will be amazed by the work of the Spirit and the good news of Jesus Christ. Let us pray. God, we live in a world which, in which we have to prove ourselves. We have to earn our keep. Everything is conditional. As hard as we try, sometimes we have a hard time accepting your unconditional love. We have a hard time truly turning over our life to you and living as you have called us to live. Lord, help us do that. Help us live as Jesus showed us how to live. Help us know that you love us no matter what. And most of all, help us to love others no matter what. In your name we pray. Amen.
Now, if you would stand as we sing our closing hymn, Grace Greater Than Our Sin. You may not be called to be a pastor, but all of us as followers of Jesus are called. Whatever gifts you have and talents you have, you can use them for the glory of God. As you go through this week, the next days and months of your life, I hope you will have a new attention to why you do what you do, how you do what you do, and the ways that God is working in your life. No that the grace and the love of Jesus Christ and the power of the Holy Spirit is with you now and always. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen.